human has been neutralized. This Wii U gamepad has a bad charging port, so I'm going to replace it. The gamepad disassembles from the back, and the first step is to remove the battery cover, which is held in by two double zero cross style screws. I'm going to use my trusty Moody JIS driver. So, just remove the two screws and then pry off the cover. Next, pop out the battery connector and then pop out the battery. There are 10 screws fastening the back of the gamepad and they are hidden by plastic inserts. So, I'm going to use the pointy end of my metal spudger to get these off. Just pry underneath and peel them off. I stuck them to the back of the battery cover for safekeeping. Okay, now we've got the screw covers removed, and to remove the screws, you're going to need a tri wing screwdriver. The screws were in very tight, so be careful and make sure your driver is in good condition so you don't damage the screws. Also, set the screws aside in a container so you don't lose any, or you can just leave them sitting in the holes and they'll stay if you're careful when pulling off the back. Once the screws are out, tilt the back cover up carefully because there's a wire connected to the circuit board. So there's the inside of the gamepad. Now, disconnect the connector from the circuit board. Be sure to pull the connector and not on the wires. Once the connector is free, you can lift the back off and set it aside. The L and R buttons uh, lift out easily. And to remove the ZL and ZR buttons, just tilt them straight up and then slide them out to the side. Like that, and it'll pull straight out. Okay, now that we have the buttons out, there are quite a few connectors that must be disconnected. Here are the two speakers, for example, and you can see where the cables run to. I'm just going to use the tip of my spudger and just to help kind of lever these out and um, use my fingernail on one side and the spudger on the other. These other connectors will come out in a similar fashion. Next, I'll remove the connectors uh, next to the analog sticks. Uh, these connectors end up being a bit in the way later, and some, su some guides suggest removing the analog stick assembly, but I found that wasn't necessary. To remove them, just push down on the retaining clip and out, and they will pop out. So just below the analog stick connector on the right is a, a flat flex connector. These can be kind of delicate, so be careful. Use the tip of a flat blade tool to gently lift up on the clip and then pull the cable out from the back. Here's another flat flex you need to remove on the left hand side as well and it comes out about the same way. Although I had to try a few different angles before this one wanted to come out. Just take your time and don't force anything. Now on the bottom left, there's a bit of a sturdier flex cable to remove. Again, just lift up on the clip to release the cable and pull it out gently. This connector is on the upper right and it's a pretty delicate one, but follows the same principles. I couldn't find a nice way to pull this one, uh, so I ended up just using a plastic spudger to kind of press down on it and, and glide it out. Next, remove the small connector which goes to the digitizer. 
and I was able to use tweezers to pull this one out. And then for the big display connector, for this one, use a wide bladed tool or even two different tools to lift the clip because it wants to bow in the middle and it won't open easily. Now I remove the Wi-Fi module, gently pry up from the bottom and the connector will pop off. You will notice that the module is stuck down with some adhesive. I use my spudger to slide under the adhesive pad and lift it off. This pad is actually important because it's conductive and it helps ground the module, so be sure to keep it intact. Next, I remove the other RF module on the other side of the board, which comes off basically the same way. Prying it from the bottom, the connector pops off and there's a small amount of adhesive keeping it stuck down. Next you'll need a number zero cross style driver to remove the screws holding down the circuit board. There are three screws. Now, once the screws are out, carefully lift off the board, being careful to clear any snagged cables. On the circuit board, there's a plastic bracket by the charging port that needs to be removed. It's held on by some weak adhesive, so just pry it off with a flat bladed tool. And I just slide my spudger under it and pry a little bit. So here's the replacement charging port I'm going to install, but first I'll need to remove the old one. I start by applying some leaded solder to the existing solder points. The existing solder is lead free, so adding some leaded will lower the melting temperature a bit, and it's actually a little easier to remove solder when there's a bit of excess. Now I started out by using a solder sucker to remove the solder from the solder points and this works out pretty well for some of the pins. However, I ran into quite a bit of trouble with this. Now if I was going to do this and not make a video for it, I would have just skipped the solder sucker and went straight to my hot air station. However, I know that many watchers don't have all of the equipment so I try to do things on my videos using the most commonly available tools and pretty much everyone that's going to try to do this at least has a soldering iron and hopefully a solder sucker. Now, that being said, I worked at this for at least a half an hour, if not more, and I can say that trying to do it this way is a really bad idea. I've left several minutes of the footage to try to dissuade you from trying it. After the solder sucker, I tried solder wick. I later even broke out my industrial strength vacuum desoldering station. Here I finally had enough and I went ahead and cut the charging port off to try to reduce the amount of thermal mass I was dealing with. And this is really the problem. The PCB is multi-layered and there is a massive ground plane which the ground pins are connected to. So all of the heat I was applying to try to melt the solder is getting wicked away very quickly and I just wasn't able to get enough heat into the board fast enough to be able to get the solder sucked or wicked out before it solidified again. So the best way I know to tackle removing a through hole multi pin connector with a giant thermal mass is to use hot air, which allows you to heat everything up at once, including the PCB itself. Now, I ended up saving this job using hot air, but not after lifting one of the pads and wasting a ton of time. It would have been so much easier to do it from the start. To see how this should have gone, check out my video on how to change the shoulder button on a GBA, which is a similar situation. Basically, you just attach something slightly heavy to the connector and then you heat it up from the other side with hot air.
Once all the solder melts, gravity pulls the connector out nicely, and then you can just use some wick or a sucker to remove any remaining solder. So I'm just gonna take some uh, uh, hemostat and clamp it um, to the bottom here, and not too close to the where the not, not too close to the other side because I, I don't want this to be too much of a, a heat sink, but um, I do I do need it to add some some weight to the other side so it'll give it a little bit of a pull. Uh, and then I'm going to get my hot air gun. I've got the um, WEP 858D um, hot air station. It's about $65 on Amazon. I find it's a really valuable tool for for the money. It's it's um, very handy, very versatile. So I've got it set on uh, 400 degrees, um, which is pretty hot, and I got to be a little careful not to burn anything up. It's a, it's a little bit messy uh, way to do it. Um, it's not pretty, but it, it seems to work um, pretty well. Okay, and here I am trying with my my vacuum desoldering uh, pump, and that didn't really work a whole lot better. And you can see I'm trying to heat up with my iron and the soldering pump at the same time I'm, I'm heating up one of the ground pads and uh, and also using the sucker on the other pad now I finally break out uh, my hot air gun and again like I said if I had just done this from the start it would have been uh, five or ten minutes and it would have been if that and it would have been out so what's happened here is I've I've gotten most of the solder out but there's still a part of the pin that's stuck in the hole so um, that was the final thing I needed to do was to get that little bit of metal out from the net that pin that I'm working on that uh, pad is actually the ground pad and it's connected to all the other those uh, big big slots so I finally have this uh, cleaned up and clear and you can see the pad I lifted which is a shame but uh, fortunately there's uh, more than one ground point so it wasn't an essential uh, it wasn't essential for the pad to be here So there's the new connector uh, put in for a test fit, side by side with the original, and we're going to solder now and just add some flux. And place the connector in and solder. Now I should have uh, used a bigger tip on my iron because of the thermal mass here, but I don't, actually don't have one. And if I had had a, a larger tip, it, maybe it would have been easier to do this with an iron. But again, hot air is, I think, the way to go on this. Now, I got a little bit too much solder on that pin, so just break out the, uh, the braid and wick up the excess. Okay, so that looks um, pretty good. And uh, one of these looked kind of thin, so I went back and added some more solder. So with that finally in, we can start reassembling. I use my spudger to the thread the display connector back through the slot and get the assorted cables and connectors out from under the board. And you can see there where I used some Kapton tape to keep some of the wires out of the way earlier on.
And again, you can see where these uh, analog stick connectors kind of got in my way. And I could have taken the assemblies out, but it seemed like more work. I'm not sure which one's less or more work. And get the board lined up there. Make sure that all of your cables and connectors are free. Because a lot of them like to hide underneath that board when you put it back in. And get the power, um, actually the volume slider lined back up. And with the board sitting where it's supposed to, uh, you can screw down the PCB with the three screws. And when putting the uh, flat flexes back in, just make sure that the clips are flipped right side up. Insert the flat flex into the connector. Make sure it's all lined up and in snug, and then flip the clip back down. To reinsert the RF modules uh, back in the board connectors, it's a little easier if you tilt the board up so you can see them go in. But they basically just press fit. And so they'll, they'll feel like they kind of snap in a little bit. And just using a spudger and to help line up the, the analog stick connector, just kind of uh, push that one back in. And the, most of the flat flexes are, are pretty much the same. Flip them up, kind of line them up. Push them in and flip it back down. Now this little flat flex is pretty thin and it's kind of hard to see where it goes in, but um, it just kind of does. So get it in place. I use some, some tweezers here. And uh, for the display port, or for the display connector, um, just make sure it goes in straight. You can actually get it in kind of crooked like I started to there. So just uh, make sure it's got get in there straight. And I had to re-angle it to be able to see kind of what I was doing there. But once it's in straight, just flip the, the clip back down. Okay, and tweezers are helpful for sticking the, uh, the digitizer cable back in. Okay, and on this um, on this connector that connects to the uh, one of the analog sticks, it's actually kind of helpful to have a spudger to lever it in a place. There's not a lot of room over there to get your fingers in. Okay, same deal with this RF module. I can't remember if this is Bluetooth or if it's um, just a proprietary uh, type, but um, anyway. And you can see I'm changing up which tools I'm using, whichever one I feel is more convenient at the time. I use tweezers, a metal spudger, plastic spudger, sometimes just use my, my fingers. It just depends on what's easiest for you. Okay, so once all of the, the connectors are, are back in place, I actually pulled out a photo that I took uh, 
when I first started to help me make sure I got all the wires routed back in the right places. And this is important because if you leave wires in the wrong places, sometimes they can get pinched or cut by the case. And to reinsert the DL and ZR buttons, just slide them back in their little slot and rotate them back down. And put the um, L and R buttons back in. And you can kind of see how they are supposed to go. And if you put them in right, they will feel like they work. So uh, with the case in hand, the back of the case, reconnect um, the battery wire to the circuit board. And line up the back and set it down in place. And be sure to check the alignment of the volume slider before buttoning it back up. And maybe check the buttons and make sure they feel right. Now we'll just put the tin screws back in and reinstall the battery and the battery cover. Now, most of the plastic screw covers had enough sticky left on them to simply put them back in place, but a few of them wouldn't stay stuck. So I cleaned any adhesive residue off of them and applied some double-sided um, LCD screen cover tape that I happen to have, uh, cut it down to size, and apply them to get those to stick. So that basically concludes the repair. Uh, so if you like this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and share. Let's been neutralized.